Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, or ARDS. It's a life-threatening form of respiratory failure. It's the primary cause of death from COVID-19. But ARDS isn't just from the coronavirus. It's a common condition in critically ill patients. It's manifest by the acute onset of pulmonary edema, fluid filling up into the lung that's not due to heart problems, so it's not due to congestive heart failure, has low levels of oxygen in the blood, and the need for mechanical ventilation. But it's not a disease by itself. It's a syndrome. It was described in 1967 by Dr. John Murray. Dr. Murray died in March of 2020 because of coronavirus-induced ARDS. Each year in the United States, there are approximately 200,000 people who develop the condition. About 75,000 people die in normal circumstances, unfortunately more because of coronavirus. Under normal circumstances, more people die of ARDS than die of breast cancer or HIV. The overall mortality used to be about 60%. Then fortunately, it was brought down to somewhere between 35 and 45%. But now with the coronavirus, it's back up to around 60 plus percent. Now, if we look at people who are in the intensive care units, at least a quarter of them are there receiving the mechanical ventilation because of ARDS. Now, in big cities throughout the United States, the percentage is even greater. Well, people with ARDS have a fair chance of dying, and there's the misconception that it always is due to the lung. But people who have ARDS might have had some underlying medical condition, and that might be the cause of death. Maybe it was infection or cancer, immunosuppression. Maybe it was a non-pulmonary organ dysfunction, like heart disease or septic shock. Maybe it was liver disease or kidney disease. Overall, traditionally, this has been a condition that's killed more black and Hispanics than whites. It kills more men than women. We can look at the disease and say there are two different etiologies, basically. There's one that has to do with the lung, and there's one that has to do with the non-pulmonary areas. So as far as lungs are concerned, when ARDS arises from lung disease, it's typically a viral pneumonia. That's extraordinarily common. Sometimes it's due to a fungal infection, less commonly due to a bacterial infection. Oftentimes, especially in people in the nursing homes, they aspirate some of the gastric contents. When they aspirate the gastric contents, that sets off a series of events that ends up in ARDS. Same thing with patients who have dementia, who often tend to aspirate. Same sort of situation also in alcoholics. Non-pulmonary causes include severe trauma. It could be blunt penetrating injuries, could be burns. Maybe it's due to sepsis, sepsis like a urinary tract that becomes infected, the bladder, the kidney. Sometimes it's peritonitis inflammation and infection inside the abdominal cavity, maybe because of a ruptured appendix or maybe because of a ruptured diverticulum. Sometimes it may be caused by a reaction to a blood transfusion, especially with significant quantities of fresh frozen plasma, platelets, or whole blood. It's known as the transfusion-associated lung injury. TRALI is the acronym used for it. It also can be caused by a drug reaction, can, just like you can develop a rash where you can develop a problem with the lungs that can go on to ARDS, drug overdoses, near drowning, hemorrhagic shock, reperfusion injury after cardiopulmonary bypass surgery or even after lung resection. Now, most of the time we don't have any idea why the person develops the condition. Sometimes it seems there's an underlying predisposing cause that when it exists just makes people more susceptible. So if you abuse alcohol, if you smoke cigarettes, if you vape, if you have asthma, if you live in areas where there's significant air pollution, if you're in the hospital and you're getting too much fluid intravenously, that sets up the state. So does if your liver doesn't work quite right and you have hypoalbuminemia, not enough protein in the system.
Well, we can divide the ARDS into a couple different categories. So one way we can divide it is pulmonary subtype and non-pulmonary subtype. That seems to make sense. When it's pulmonary subtype, it seems that the epithelial cells inside the lung are the primary target. When it's non-pulmonary, it seems like it's the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. We can also divide it into the hyperinflammatory or the hypoinflammatory subtypes, the hyperinflammatory, as we would find with an infectious disease, COVID-19. Well, unfortunately, has a decreased survival compared to the hypoinflammatory, where the inflammation isn't as significant a component when inflammation is not a significant component, then the death rate seems to be lower. It seems there's also a genetic predisposure to the condition, a genetic predisposure. That's why some people seem, when they get the COVID-19, to develop ARDS, and other people don't. Other people might not have any symptoms. Well, it's thought that it might have something to do with the cells that line the blood vessels, or the cells that line the lungs, or some other susceptibility that isn't otherwise obvious. Now, sometimes it can be confusing to make the diagnosis. It can be easily confused with uh, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, a variety of other circumstances. In order to make a standard definition, a group of investigators got together in 2012 in Berlin, came up with a definition where it would occur in a specific time interval within one week of some known insult to the lung and the respiratory failure could not be due to congestive heart failure or fluid overload like you might get in the hospital. Also had to have an abnormality on the chest x-ray where there would be opacities on both the right side and the left side of the lung and had to have low levels of oxygen in the bloodstream and could be divided into mild ARDS or moderate or severe ARDS depending on the level of oxygen compared to the amount of oxygen that's being put into the system. Well, under the best of circumstances, the mortality, even for the mild ARDS, is about 25%. It's well in excess of 50% for severe ARDS. People with ARDS typically will end up on a ventilator for anywhere between 5 and 10 days. Children have their own criteria for the condition. But it's interesting to note that it's not infrequent in children less than 5 years of age. It tends to be more in males than in females. Oftentimes it's due to viral pneumonia, just like it is in adults. Now, when the patient develops the condition, it can come on slowly or extraordinarily rapidly. People complain of moderate to severe respiratory distress. The heart rate is increased. The respiratory rate is increased. They have an obvious hard time of breathing. You can tell they're using what we call the accessory muscles of respiration. They're hypoxemic. They're low levels of oxygen in the blood. We can determine that just by looking at the fingernails. They're sort of cyanotic, tend to be relatively blue. And as I mentioned, this can come on extraordinarily rapidly. You're okay one moment and just half an hour later, you're having extraordinarily difficulty breathing or it can come on slowly over the course of hours to days. Now, even though coronavirus, COVID-19, seems to be the major cause right now, have to consider when a patient comes to the physician that it might be some other cause. It might be the standard kind of pneumonia. And it's important to distinguish whether it's pneumonia from the hospital or pneumonia from the community. Where did it come from? Because the organisms that are responsible tend to have different susceptibilities to the antibiotics. So we can do some simple tests, some nucleic acid detection tests, Obviously, there's a test for the coronavirus. Have to make sure that the person doesn't have peritonitis, have a ruptured abscess. That's obviously important. Well, when it comes right down to it, can we easily distinguish between heart-related and lung-related causes? No, sometimes it's very difficult, but there's a blood test called the BNP, brain natriuretic peptide, that's easily available. And if that's elevated, it tends to mean it's the heart. In research settings, there are some fancier kind of tests that can be done, but basically, it's an injury, and it's an injury to the cells that line the blood vessels in the lung, the little tiny capillaries. We call those endothelial cells. They're just a single membrane, a single lining, single cell lining. 
And right next to them is a single cell lining inside the alveoli of the lungs. And that's what we call the epithelial cells. And it seems like it's an injury to both of those cells. Now, under normal circumstances, those cells are responsible for allowing gas to go in both directions. So oxygen comes in and carbon dioxide goes out. Fluid stays out because the cells, the endothelial cells in the blood vessels and the epithelial cells in the lung, they're tightly bound together. So they don't allow any fluid to go from the blood into the lungs. And if any did by accident, well, it can be pumped out, it pumped out into the interstitium of the lung and then it's absorbed through the lymphatics. But in the condition that we're talking about, in the ARDS, there's an injury, there's an insult to those cells in the lining of the blood vessel, the endothelial cells, they don't stick together very tightly. They do allow some of the fluid, the serum, the plasma, to float into the lung. They allow some of the white blood cells, some of the other substances in the blood, like the platelets, get into the area of the lung. And that's because the cells inside the lung, those epithelial cells, they don't stick too tightly together. And then all of a sudden, there's another kind of a cell that's native to the lung. It's called an alveolar macrophage. It's a type of a white blood cell. And it's part of the immune system and the inflammatory system. And it can become activated. And when it becomes activated, then it starts calling in other kind of blood cells. And those other blood cells, like the white blood cells, the lymphocytes and the neutrophils, they start releasing some of their substances. And when they release their substances, then they call in more inflammatory cells, more fluid gets into the lung, and then we have a horrible situation where now all of a sudden the spaces that are supposed to have oxygen that can get into the blood, now they're full of fluid. So now we have a mismatch of areas that are being perfused, but there's no oxygen in those areas that can get into the bloodstream. So now all of a sudden we start having a decrease in the amount of oxygen in the system. And all the while, when this is going on, those cells are releasing some substances known as cytokines. And those cytokines are very important for the inflammatory condition. So we now have a massive ongoing and self-perpetuating inflammatory condition inside the lung. And some of that material is going to seep out and get into the systemic circulation. And if the situation gets bad enough, then all of a sudden, now we're going to have, in addition to the lung injury, now we're going to have additional injury in the heart, in the liver, in the kidneys, even in the brain. Other areas are going to be affected. So during this so-called phase, the exudative phase, when all of the cells and all of those cytokines are causing problems, we have a situation where the people can't breathe very well. We have the mismatch of the blood and the air spaces that are now filled with fluid. And ultimately, that can be mended. And the exudative phase can get into a proliferative phase when some of those cells inside the lung, we call those the type 2 alveolar cells, they sort of look like peas. Actually, if we looked at the inside of the lung, it would look like it's lined by string beans, really flat, small cells, and peas, little bumpy, protruding, cuboidal cells. And those cuboidal cells we call the AT2 cells. Well, they start to heal the whole process. They're important because they make surfactant. They actually are the cells responsible for keeping the lung cells of the alveoli open. Well, they start to heal the situation in the proliferative stage. And then some fibrous tissue is laid down. The exudative phase takes usually about a week or thereabout. The proliferative phase takes about three weeks. Question is, how can we treat the situation? Well, that's a major problem, and we don't have a good answer. So steroids have been tried. Anti-inflammatory drugs have been tried. The kind of medicines we use for asthma have been tried. The statin drugs have been tried because they were thought to be anti-inflammatory. We have some other substances that seem to open the blood vessels, like the nitric oxide. All of those have been tried, and nothing, at least to the present time, seems to work. 
Now there's another situation. If the problem goes on for too long and if there's too much compromise of the system, well, then it gets to be self-perpetuating and even if we get rid of the inciting event, unfortunately we can't cure the situation. Well, there's some things we can do. So if the situation arose because you have bacterial pneumonia or you have an abscess in your abdomen, it could either be drained or we could go with some oral antibiotics. Careful fluid management is very important because we get too much fluid inside the system oftentimes and when the fluid's inside the system that we give by intravenous, some of that is going to end up in the lung. Obviously that's not the situation that we want. Then there's a situation about respiratory support. Respiratory support is extraordinarily important and the respiratory support has to do with are we going to intubate the person, are we going to use the nasal oxygen, are we going to use a mask of oxygen, are we going to use some other kind of device and the answer is it all depends on what the patient's status is and what the arterial saturation of oxygen is. Obviously in people who are less severely ill, maybe they just need some nasal oxygen or a mask or maybe they need some extra pressure. Actually there's a, an interesting device, it's sort of a helmet. So instead of having a mask with peep that doesn't seem to work very well because too much of the gas escapes around the sides of the mask, well they put a helmet on. And if you put the helmet on, you can get much higher pressure which sometimes is quite helpful. It's not uh, terribly widely available, unfortunately. Well, we also could use some high-flow nasal oxygen. That seems to help a lot of people stay off of the invasive respiration. We like to keep people off the invasive respiration, mechanical ventilation, because it has to be associated with some neuromuscular blockade. We have to paralyze the person, in effect. And then in addition to that, you have to sedate the person. Well, all of those situations come with other kinds of problems. And the ventilator itself have an increased incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Well, additionally, when a person's on a ventilator, when a person's intubated, the person can't communicate. So we try as hard as we can to avoid doing that. Now, there are different kinds of mechanical ventilators. So we have the assist control mode where the respirator just is kind of a backup. You breathe and as long as you're breathing normally then the respirator doesn't do all that much. If you don't take a breath at the appropriate time with the appropriate amount of force then the respirator gives you a breath. On the other hand there's another kind it's called the controlled ventilator mode and that ventilator just automatically at a preset rate will breathe for you. Well, the only effective therapy we have for ARDS is some kind of ventilation. And the way we ventilate the lung is somewhat controversial. The lung in a person who has ARDS is going to be non-uniformly aerated. And because it's going to be non-uniformly aerated, the volume is going to be smaller than normal. And that brings up a major issue. How much air are we going to put into the lung? Well, typically we calculate it on your predicted body weight and we know what it ought to be. We know what it is in normal people, but unfortunately the lungs or the effective lung area, effective lung volume in people who have ARDS because you have all that fluid in and a lot of areas that aren't really used, the predicted area isn't as big as we would otherwise calculate. So when the condition was first described, people were getting an awful lot of tidal volume, just the amount of air that was going in. It was about 12 to 15 milliliters a kilogram. Well, very shortly thereafter, it's described in 1967 and by the mid-70s, it seemed that that was just too much air. It was making the people worse, so it was cut way down. It was cut from 12 to 15 milliliters a kilogram down to somewhere between 4 and 8 milliliters per kilogram. That seems to be enough. 
and it seems to be a more realistic amount. Well, how much pressure? That's another kind of issue because a lot of people on the ventilators are adversely affected by the ventilator. So we have to worry about the tidal volume, the amount of air, the volume of the air that we're putting in. Also have to worry about the pressure and there are different areas of pressure, how much pressure going in, what's the peak end expiratory pressure going to be, what's the plateau pressure going to be. And that raises another kind of issue. We have a condition called valley or villi. It's ventilator-associated lung injury. Some people call it ventilator-induced lung injury. It's injury because of the ventilator that seems to perpetuate the systemic inflammatory response. So it contributes to the multiple organ failure, contributes sometimes to death. So it's important that there's that fine line that has to be followed. Not too much, not too little. We know that high pressure, just using too much pressure in the mechanical ventilation is going to lead to some biochemical injury and inflammation inside the lung. It's going to be toxic to those endothelial cells, the epithelial cells going to cause them, just simply by pressure, to start releasing some of those chemicals that we talked about that seem to incite the whole problem. Well, we've learned over the years that a prone position seems to be much better as far as aerating the lung is concerned. So we would like people to be lying on their stomach, not the back, but the stomach, for at least 16 hours a day. 12 hours should be probably the minimum. That seems to make a big difference as far as the ultimate death rate is concerned. Now, when we talk about some of those medicines that I mentioned before, some of those neuroparalyzing medicines and muscle paralyzing medicines, well, probably the sedatives, the tranquilizers, not enough by themselves. Because even when people have sedation, they can fight the machine. They cause a certain amount of dyssynchrony. And that dyssynchrony causes pressure problems inside the lung. And then there's the oxygen. What level of oxygen do we use? You can become oxygen toxic. So there's too much of a good thing. And then there's recruitability. There's this PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure that we talked about. Well, that has to do with when you blow the air out, how much pressure is there left in the lung? Well, people argue about high PEEP and low PEEP, and that's obviously very important because if we have too high a PEEP, that can cause rupture of some of the small damaged air sacs inside the lung. If we don't have enough, obviously the cells are going to collapse and they can't open up again. So there are some other concepts that have come through over the period of years. One has to do with the high frequency oscillatory ventilation. That's relatively low tidal volume. That's good. But it's very rapid respiratory rate, and that's bad. That actually impairs the ability of the blood to get back to the heart. So that seems to be one of those things that have been tried, but didn't seem to do very well. Now, there's one that's sort of going around in the settings now, and it's called ECMO. It stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And that has to do with actually taking some of the blood out of the body oxygenating it in the machine and putting it back. Well, that got to be the rage, and many hospitals throughout the country were investing in the equipment, except the studies show that it really doesn't do much good. Well, while we're so worried about the patient's lungs and treating infection, also have to worry about feeding the patient, because remember, we're talking about someone who's going to probably be incapacitated for a week or thereabout. Well, during that time, the person's going to be catabolic. The person's going to be breaking down some of the tissue, so we have to give them some nutrition. Well, how do you give them the nutrition? Do you feed them intravenously? Do you feed them through a gastric tube, a tube that slipped down the nose into the stomach? Well, that's going to add volume. How much volume can we add? So it gets to be very difficult, and even if you survive, and unfortunately, it's sort of a toss of the coin right now, those people who do survive are left with some persistent physiologic problems, neuropsychiatric problems. They're left with cognitive problems, problems with attention and memory and concentration and mood disorders. Sometimes they have difficulty processing 
because they've been treated with tracheostomies. Some of the people have stenosis, have difficulty. Some of the people have problems with their muscles. They have muscle wasting while they're in the hospital and they can have contractures depending on how they're lying. So unfortunately at the present time that's a story about ARDS conditions much more frequent than we would like. Currently it's the major cause of death in the COVID-19 under normal circumstances. We have about 200,000 cases now. We're going to have many more. And unfortunately, we don't really have any good therapy. We don't have any good therapy other than we provide enough oxygen, but just the right amount, not too much pressure, not too little pressure. We buy enough time to allow the body to heal. And if the body heals, then we claim it was very successful. Unfortunately, what we do right now is we treat and we wait and we hope. And we hope we don't make things worse. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you had enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so you'll be notified when we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.